get going. And I'm just going to talk into this microphone here just a little bit, just to make sure everyone can hear. Is there anyone in a pocket where there's a little fuzziness or anything? Okay. Oh, that's good. That's good. Raise your hand or speak out or whatever. We're delighted to have you here. This is the second gallery talk, second of five, that we're going to have in conjunction with the exhibit. And if you have not had a chance to uh, browse the exhibit, I hope that you will do so before you leave tonight or definitely come back. This is the sort of thing that might take a couple of visits to really absorb everything. Of course, this show is a more historical perspective and then across the hall, the models that are absolutely delightful to look at. We're especially grateful to the Union Pacific Foundation for their monetary support of this uh, exhibition and also the Alliant Energy Foundation and the, uh, the Ames Convention and Visitors Bureau Community Grant Program. So we're very, very pleased to have that kind of grant support for this project. Um, if you uh, do not have a printed schedule of the upcoming gallery talks, be sure to pick up the, the postcard with the uh, picture of the train on the front over on the table just to post on your fridge make sure you don't miss the next three gallery talks. And uh, we are generously supported by our members. And if you understand the importance of maintaining our local history stories, please become a member and support the things that we do. But tonight we're very pleased to have Bob Bourne here, uh, uh, one of the uh, few resident experts on the Fort Dodge Des Moines and Southern Line in Ames. And he's going to take it away. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Kathy. Um, well, this is uh, similar to the talk I gave a couple years ago on the uh, Winter Lecture Series. Um, we made a few changes here and there. And um, I have a couple of questions that have come up as we've worked through this, uh, gone through this talk a couple of times. So I see several experts in the audience, so maybe you could uh, provide some help on, uh, on some of the questions we have. Um, this talk is about after the dinky. Uh, Kathy gave a great presentation last month on the dinky, which was the steam power train that ran from downtown uh, to campus. Um, and I have to be careful because you know you start looking at these uh, pictures, and there's just so there's just so, there's so much to look at each one of them that uh, we can spend way too much time on it. And that's why you got to take your time going through our uh, banners here. So uh, I'm not going to go on too much on the history of the dinky. Um, I do want to point out that it started at Duff and what is now Main Street and went along Fifth Street and then crossed the Chicago Northwestern. This is Grand Avenue here. And crossed the Chicago Northwestern and then went out to campus. Uh, it was steam powered. It had a little steam locomotive, pulled a couple of uh, uh, passenger cars, and then had one uh, freight car. Um, so that, that was the route uh, up until the electric line was built, Fort Dodge. Um, the, the history on that, I'm not going to go to the Ames and College, which was the Dickey, the railroad, the Dickey, locally owned, locally developed. Uh, the Fort Dodge line was kind of a combination of a couple of railroads. Uh, the Newton and Northwestern operated from Newton uh, through Cambridge, and it's always interesting to look at Cambridge as a major rail center. It had a north south line. <laughs> East-West Line, <laughs> Northwestern, don't quite think of Cambridge as, as that uh, hub of activity now. Uh, and they went through Napier. We do have the Napier Depot, the original Fort Dodge Depot from Napier is over at the Blue Encina Valley, right on Story Street with the electric line uh, across the Story Street over there. We got that about 20 years ago. It was an apartment building in Ames. And then it went up to, uh, went through Boone, uh, where the Boone and Scenic Valley runs now, and then out to uh, Rockwell City. Um, that was a 19, this is a 1904 man. Uh, as with all railroads, when they advertised, they were the center of the universe and everything else uh, uh, followed. So, of course, the, this is an ad in some of the official uh, freight journal, rail, rail journals for traffic, traffic journals. Uh, for, they used to solicit traffic business. So, of course, Des Moines was way down at the bottom of the state and Fort Dodge was at the top. But what it shows all the combination and all the connections, and that's what the emphasis on this railroad was, was the uh, connections. It moved a lot of grain, moved a lot of coal. Boone County was a major coal producer. There was a lot of local coal. Uh, the big traffic over the years was the gypsum up in Fort Dodge. And they had connections by, by a couple railroads to Minneapolis, several railroads to Chicago, uh, St. Louis, and Kansas City. So they could ship gypsum all over the, uh, all over the country. So the history in Ames, uh, 
and I'm just a little digression, that these panels we have here really are AIMS focus. It's about the railroad in AIMS. And we spend a lot of time going through our resources. We have an AIMS historical and the, uh, also the AIMS uh, Tribune uh, history. So we have a lot of pictures of, the, of, of different locations of AIMS and different events that happen in the railroad. Uh, the AIMS and College Railroad was 1891 to 1907. That was the locally owned uh, railroad. The Newton and Northwestern that I just showed you started in 1898 to 1912. Now, the original part of that was the Boone Valley, Boone Valley Coal, which is now the Boone and Scenic Valley. And it actually had about three different names in a five-year period. Uh, one time it was the Marshalltown, Dakota, and Western, and the owners were going to extend it east to Marshalltown and then west to uh, North Dakota and eventually out to the West Coast. So they dreamed big back then uh, when you were building a railroad. Uh, the Fort Dodge Des Moines and Southern uh, bought the Newton and Northwestern, eventually integrated it into their operations, and it extended service into Ames in uh, 1906. Uh, this is Homer Loring. He was the uh, uh, one of the uh, financiers of the uh, Fort Dodge line. Uh, he was uh, East Coast. He's from Boston. Uh, this is him on, on the stand by the train there. And uh, he's the one that kind of brought that East Coast money here to, to buy and build the, buy the existing railroad and then build, uh, build the expansion. There's several stories about him. Uh, he had a, a summer cabin in a house in, uh, I forget it was either Spirit Lake or Storm Lake. And uh, they would run the Fort Dodge because he's the president. They'd run a train up to the Milwaukee Railroad connection, and if, the, if his train was late, they would hold the passenger train on the Milwaukee train so that he didn't have to wait for his connection. So I guess you do that when you're president of the railroad. Uh, Parley Sheldon, as everyone knows, uh, he was the perennial mayor of Ames, was elected several times over a 30-year period. Uh, he was the, uh, one of the owners of the original dinky, the Ames and College Railroad, and sold it to the Fort Dodge line. And uh, when the Fort Dodge Line went bankrupt in 1910, he, he then became the receiver. Uh, the stories that he used to run the steam engine back when he was bored of banking, he got up in the steam engine, run it back and forth. The campus, uh, I don't know if he did that with the electric trains or not, but he uh, <coughs> was certainly involved in the railroad. So this is the line coming into Ames. This is from uh, 1908, and uh, I guess I'll run outbound. Uh, the, uh, Route was on Fifth Street for the Dinky, moved over to Main Street um, for the uh, when they electrified. Still crossed the uh, Northwestern there by Grand Avenue, and used that existing right of way out to campus. And then from campus they went on a kind of a southwesterly angle. Uh, we have a couple pictures coming up here to show you this. Uh, this is Welch Avenue here, and uh, so it was in the alley between Welch and Stanton. There's still a pole line there. You can see a few few remnants of that. Then it went south, uh, straight south from campus, and uh, the Stevens Farm was where the ice rink is now, the old ice rink and the new ice rink. So uh, the, the uh, J.L. Stevens Farm, there's a big deep cut there, and if you park, well, there's not enough parking at the ice rink, blame it on the city if you want, uh, but the uh, you have to park in the uh, parking lot by the Parks and Rec office and you cross a little wooden footbridge. That kind of ditch there that you're crossing was the uh, main line of the, uh, of the Fort Dodge line. And then it went down to the Zumwalt Station here. And that Zumwalt Station, when I moved here in 1981, still existed. There was still some footings and some uh, part portions of the, uh, of the Zumwalt Station was still there. And then down to Kelly, I mean, Kelly made the connection with the main line which was from Fort Dodge to uh, uh, Des Moines. Uh, this is an interesting construction picture. This is near Stanton. This is north of Knapp. It's making the curve uh, to go into that, that alley uh, 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 east of uh, Welch. And it kind of goes uphill. I have, later I have a, a current shot of this. But what I find interesting on this, this is a 1906 construction. Uh, look at all the people that are involved in building the railroad. I mean, it was a labor intensive uh, activity. Um, uh, the ditches, you know, that was all uh, probably cut with horse mules that uh, did that. And someone pointed out to me that uh, they wondered about the drainage on this because uh, all good civil engineers know water goes downhill. So 
whatever's going down here isn't going to go down the ditch that way. It's going to go right over there, right through, through the road bed. So hopefully that's some kind of a road they're building there or something, because you need some culverts in there. And that's what I like about giving this presentation, is people come up at the end and tell me obvious things that I don't see. So uh, I'll, I'll appreciate that after, after this uh, presentation. Uh, this is, again, another crew. Uh, I think there's about 15, 16 guys there. Uh, this is the Iowa State Power Plant, the original Iowa State Power Plant, which is now kind of buried in the current power plant. Um, this is the track went by the went to the south side of it, and then here's the uh, switch track, the siding where they brought the coal in for the, for the power plant, uh, and that shows a kind of a typical track crew of uh, the number of people involved. As you see, it's all uh, uh, it's labor. It's just good old hard work. You know, you shovel it and you pounded the spikes in and all that. So it was just a lot of physical work to build this thing. Um, south of Ames, now this is, uh, uh, we think this is at the cut uh, by the Stevens uh, farm. Uh, most of rare, most railroad building in Ames occurred in, or in Iowa, occurred uh, in the late summer or the fall and into the winter till the ground froze. And the reason is the ground was pretty muddy in the spring. Um, so this is a typical, uh, it's a steam powered traction engine. There's a boiler, uh, has a cylinder that spins this around. And what they're doing here is they're yanking stumps to, to cut the, uh, to do that. And then they'll come back with a blade on the back and uh, uh, cut the grain on it. So that was a pretty typical uh, uh, power plant for that kind of activity. A lot of, if you go to farm uh, shows now, you'll see these things. Uh, you know, with this flywheel threshing grain or doing some, some kind of activity. But these were really the construction, they were the, you know, the caterpillars, the bulldozers of, of the era. Uh, this is the cut at Stevens after it was finished, and this, the ice rink will be right about back here. Um, now, with another person pointed out to me, it's interesting that this is probably in the spring, because the snow's pretty dirty, a little bit of snow left over. Um, but that hill is not going to stay like that very long. As you can see, it's starting to uh, uh, assume the angle of repose, as the, as the engineers say. And uh, so they probably spent a year or two or three uh, digging that out to make sure, you know, this part of the hill all end up down here eventually. So uh, that was part of the maintenance on it. We know this is when it's new, because look how bright those ties are. That wood has not been treated, and it's uh, freshly cut. Um, Okay, this is the arrival at Ames. This is the first car that came into Ames, uh, July 1st, 1907. And again, this is another picture where we can spend a lot of time uh, looking at it. Um, what I find interesting is this is the sidewalk in front of the buildings. Uh, you know, these buildings are still here in Ames. Um, and uh, the sidewalks are higher than the roadway. And that's because people got off of their wagons and wanted to step onto the wooden sidewalk instead of uh, stepping in the mud or horse manure or whatever was there. So when the railroad built the track, they had to build it at the same elevation as the uh, sidewalk because the city was going to fill this in and uh, make it a level, uh, level, cross, uh, level surface. So the railroad was responsible for its track and then, I don't remember names, most places it was five or eight feet on either side of the uh, track, of the rail, uh, they had to do the maintenance on it. The other thing that's interesting is just the total number of people involved here. You know, Ames, this was the this was where shopping was done in Ames. And uh, so there's just a lot of activity going on on that day. Uh, this is a picture of the interurban. I guess I should spend a minute talking about an interurban and, and streetcar. They're not the same thing. Uh, the interurban was the high speed cars that ran from Ames to Kelly to Des Moines or, or Fort Dodge. Uh, the streetcar was uh, a different type of vehicle. We'll show those here in a few minutes. But these, uh, these had top speed of around 60 miles an hour. Um, and you got in the back, back, everyone loaded in the back door, and plush leather seats, you know, little first class uh, accommodations. The streetcar was a little bit more like a bus, you know, just get people on, get them off. So, uh, different uh, uh, design on them. Uh, this is a shot, again, here's the ISU power plant, um, and uh, this is the uh, experiment station barn there. Uh, this is, uh, uh, used to call it Union Drive, I don't know, I've been on campus for a couple of years, I don't remember, the, they changed some of the names of the roads. But uh, the south side of the power plant would be here, uh, and then uh, the 
track went parallel to Union Drive where the sidewalk is now. There's a two-deck parking uh, deck there now. It went right down, right down along that. Another shot is uh, at the, uh, this is Lincoln Way. This is a city car in 1925, a street car. This is Lake Laverne, which I'm supposed to remember what year that was built, but I can't. Um, it was in the 20s sometime when the Union was started. I'm sure everyone knows that uh, better. But, um, this is the, uh, this, it crossed Lincoln Way at an angle, and right where the parking deck is, uh, the, uh, the Memorial Union parking deck is where the right of way went through the, uh, uh, of course the parking deck wasn't there at the time. Uh, this is the uh, interurban car. This is a cross section of that. Um, the front of it was the motorman's cab. The motorman was on the left side of the, uh, of the cab. This is the forward direction. Uh, they could run in each direction, but they generally ran in a, uh, they had a forward and they had loops at the end to turn them around. If they had to, they could run backwards. Anytime a motorman had to run backwards, they paid him five cents an hour extra because he had to ring the bell and it didn't have a air-operated bell, so we had to pull the, pull the cords. We got five cents an hour for that. I don't know if that was a union thing or what back then, but uh, anyway. Uh, so the motorman had this cab here. Uh, this was the baggage area, and the reason the motorman's on the left is because you wanted the, the passengers got on on this side, so you unloaded your baggage here. So what kind of baggage did they carry? Well, there was a lot of express service, kind of the UPS of the day was the uh, was the Fort Dodge Railroad. You could take your package down to the station. The trains were coming by about once an hour and either get anywhere along the line up north or to the south and get on the next train. Um, they also had uh, box cars that they would put for heavier things and every night a train would come, a uh, freight train would come, pick up a box car at each station, take it to Boone, they'd sort it like, just like Federal Express does now in Memphis, resort everything and deliver them on a southbound train so you're whatever your big item was, was delivered by the next day. Um, often the motorman would work the uh, baggage portion. Sometimes they had a baggage man, depending on how busy it was, and sometimes the conductor came and helped out on the baggage. And that changed over time. Uh, when they were real busy, they had baggage, and then towards the end, the uh, motorman did that as a work. This is a, uh, a, a furnace. This heated the car. Um, uh, probably, well, I think there was coal on some of them. And then they had ductwork along the bottom, so the little fans that would blow the air, suck the air, suck the air off of the uh, uh, hot furnace, and then uh, blow it into the into the car. Uh, the smoking section was probably a guys only section, I imagine. Uh, but this is where the businessmen, uh, salesmen, that kind of, uh, were the steady clients, uh, uh, where they would be, where you could smoke. And then uh, this is the, for the rest of the passengers. Uh, there was a no smoking area, a little toilet there. And then uh, uh, the conductor was in the back. So uh, you boarded in the back, sat where you wanted to be. The conductor collected your fare and you moved, up, moved down to where you were going. Uh, these were nice riding cars. Uh, some of the cars similar to this are in a lot of museums. Uh, one out in California, Paris has a couple of cars like this. Uh, Several in Pennsylvania, Illinois Railway Museum outside of Chicago has these kind of cars, and they get them up to about 40 miles an hour. So you can see what a, what a really nice ride was uh, on those cars. Now we're going to spend a few minutes on downtown. Uh, we have a great N gauge, which is a one to 160 scale model over in the other room, and I encourage everyone to spend some time there. The, Kate Shelley Model Railroad Club, a couple were here, uh, really did a great job on that, uh, showing the buildings in Ames and the track layouts, and they're really authentic on the track layout. We were fortunate that the uh, Chicago Northwestern Historical Society had uh, a blueprint of Ames from 1900 to 1938 with every piece of track and every business in Ames during that time period. So whenever a building was added, they added it to the blueprint. If something was deleted, they uh, took it off of the blueprint. And uh, so they have all the additions and all the deletions. So we have a, a spectacular history of Ames uh, from that time period. Um, what I want to show you here just quickly, and I don't want to get off track on, on the Chicago and Northwestern, but this was a railroad yard uh, where they did all their switching. So they had their mainline trains coming on the east-west, 
But they had a line from Des Moines that came up, and then they had a line that went up to Jewel and up to Eagle Grove, and eventually out to here on uh, South Dakota. Uh, and um, so there was a lot of activity, switch engines moving cars back and forth. At one time, there was a roundhouse with a turntable here uh, until 1902. It was taken out in 1902. It just made a two-track ship for the steam locomotives that were uh, stationed here in Ames. Uh, this track over here is the Fort Dodge Line. Remember, they came up through campus, and up until 1915, from 1907 to 1915, the interurban used the same used the same track from campus, but then used the same track in town uh, and terminated. Uh, there was a track that went north on Duff for one block, and then where Banshell Park is now, there was a hotel, and then it terminated in front of the hotel there. That was the interurban uh, terminal. And we also think that the interurban sold tickets uh, right here at uh, Douglas and Main Street, because there are several pictures of, of people getting on there. And, you know, anyone who could do some research on that, we'd appreciate that. But that's our working theory on that right now. Anyway, this proved to be a problem, as I'll show you in a minute, crossing the, the main line. For the streetcar to cross the main line in the Northwestern, uh, and, and the Northwestern didn't have anywhere near the traffic they have now. They had. Uh, uh, well, the peak passenger trains, they got up to about, uh, I think it was 12 or 13 each way, but they didn't run as many freight trains as they run now. The volume wasn't as great. There was a lot more competition. Uh, but they did have a lot of switching activity. The switch engine would grab on us cars and back and forth and back and forth. And the uh, uh, tower that controlled the crossing was owned by the Northwestern. It had a Northwestern employee. So if two trains were approaching at the same time, the Northwestern would always have the priority to get their work done. So what the Fort Dodge line had here was a passing sighting. There were two streetcars going back and forth, and they had to meet somewhere. Well, the center between downtown and campus isn't right here near downtown. The center, distance-wise, is over kind of near where the Syrac garage is or somewhere over, or by University Avenue there. So what they had here was a passing track. So if the outbound streetcar didn't, wasn't blocked, they could get across the crossing quick. He'd pull into here and wait for the inbound streetcar, and they always met him. If he got delayed and the inbound streetcar into downtown got there first, he'd sit here and wait until this guy could get across, and then they'd do the crossing. So I think the, the reliability of the service probably was not, not that good. Uh, but it's interesting how they compensated for that. Um, we also have, uh, the after 1915, uh, the, the Fort Dodge Line built a new depot for the interurban. And they were developing their regular railroad carload freight, which a lot of the electric railroads did not do. But the Fort Dodge and several of the Iowa railroads really developed the freight business, which made a lot more money than the passenger business and proved to really uh, uh, be pretty uh, uh, astute uh, business uh, strategy. So right now, where Greater Iowa Credit Union is, uh, was the terminal, the terminal, and that the, the uh, interurban cars would come in, they'd make the loop and wait there, and then the freight trains would come in, and there was a little yard where they could uh, switch. Also, one of the other maps, uh, General Filter was over here near uh, Oak and uh, North Second, and at one time there was a track going this way, a track going this way, and you know everything went by train, nothing went by truck, so everything, everybody had a had a delivery uh, uh, point. Um, okay, so what happens when uh, someone isn't paying attention? Okay, this is what happens. Uh, this was right away in 1907, right after the service started. This was in November of 1907. And uh, this tower is called an interlocking tower. And the name interlocking tower means it's designed so that when the guy working the tower says, you have a green signal, like for the Northwestern, automatically the other railroad, the Fort Dodge, has a red signal. Or if he gives the Fort Dodge green signal, all these little levers and stuff go make a bunch of noise and give him a red signal. Unfortunately, they hadn't been completed by the time the railroad was completed. So uh, what happened is that uh, it was a manual signal, and the guy in the interlocking tower was supposed to stop the Fort Dodge cars from crossing when the Northwestern had the green signal. And uh, on this day, he didn't do it. And uh, so the, this car was hit by a, a Northwestern uh, a train, knocked over on its side. 44, there were 44 people on, on it, or 44 people were injured. I don't know, probably everybody on it was injured. Um, and, but no one was killed, so it was probably a relatively slow speed uh, uh, collision. 
Uh, and then we don't know the number of the car. We can't make that out, but uh, we don't think it was rebuilt. So uh, somewhere in the archives of somewhere, we would know what, uh, what that car number was. Um, and of course, you see all the people standing around looking. You'd never have that in a railroad wreck now. You know, wouldn't let people get that close to it. Now, this is the Fort Dodge uh, uh, Depot right there where Greater Iowa Credit Union is. And the Kate Shelley guys have done a great job on uh, um, uh, making a, a pretty good rep, uh, model of that in, uh, in end scale. Um, this was the passenger waiting station after 1915. And uh, then there was a freight loading platform uh, with a roof over it so we could unload freight there and come and uh, you know, then be taken to the final destination by truck or uh, by, that, by 1915, everything was truck. Yeah, there's some of those old, those old pictures of the Dickey show, of horse drawn wagons, but I would imagine those were gone by 15. Uh, this is what uh, this is where I can really get delayed, and so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But any of you guys like schedules, I would love to spend some time with schedules. This is the uh, December 30th, 1907 schedule. Um, uh, this is Fort Dodge to Des Moines, and uh, it, not quite easy to read. We do have the originals over. Uh, headquarters across the street. But what this shows is that there were uh, nine trains a day from Ames uh, to Kelly. Some of them continued on to, uh, um, this time none of them continued on. Later, uh, I think it was 08 or 09, they had some that went through, but originally they were shuttle trains. But if you study the schedule, they weren't all designed to make a connection to Des Moines. They were actually, some of them designed to make a connection going north to Fort Dodge because people didn't commute to Des Moines from Ames. Um, so it was a lot of the activity going to and from campus or uh, uh, whatever, Boone or, uh, or uh, you know, other, other locations besides Des Moines. Um, so this is, this is interesting in that they, they ran the uh, shuttle cars there. Um, and then the second class trains were the freight trains. So you can see the domination. It was very much a passenger railroad in 1907. And then there were just a couple of freight trains uh, running at that time. Uh, this is the Newton and Northwestern, which the Fort Dodge line was in the process of purchasing. They actually shared trackage, um, uh, and the, the track was owned by the Fort Dodge line. The Newton and Northwestern ran a train, one train a day in each direction. Um, so this is, I can't read that, is that Newton up there? So Newton through Boone up to Rockwell City, and then this is the Des Moines to uh, Fort Dodge section. Of that. So you can see the Des Moines to Fort Dodge was the busy part of the railroad, then there was just one train a day on that part. And the, the Newton part, the Newton to uh, uh, Huxley part, uh, went out in uh, 1912. Um, so here's the, here's, here's the map of the Fort Dodge line in 1912. Uh, they ran from Newton, they had a branch down to Colfax. Uh, they were electrified at the time. The Interurban Railroad, IU, uh, later became the Des Moines and Central Iowa. That ran from Colfax to Des Moines, and then up to uh, Woodward and out to Perry. And that was an electric uh, railroad also with the high-speed uh, uh, passenger trains on it. Uh, this section was a weak part of the, of the railroad. Uh, it was abandoned in, right after 1912, and this became the strongest part of the railroad, the Des Moines to Kelly to Ames, and then up to Boone, and then up to Fort Dodge. Uh, and most of the passenger traffic was in this portion of the railroad because, of course, that's where the greatest population was yeah, and the most uh, travel uh, activity. Uh, this is the November 3rd, 1912 schedule. Uh, this shows Fort Dodge to Des Moines, uh, 86 miles. It took about, what, three and a half hours. They had an express train that did it in about three hours. In 1912, if you could average 30 miles an hour, you were going pretty darn fast. That was pretty high speed. And to average 30 miles an hour, you had to go 60 miles an hour because of all the stops on the route. Um, so there were uh, eight or nine trains a day between Fort Dodge and Des Moines. Uh, the Ames schedule, uh, and if we study this, this is when they were running, some of them were running through all these trains here. The uh, eight of these trains were through trains. You could get on in Ames and get down to Des Moines. So you got out in Ames at 7.45 you get to Des Moines at 9.24, so it was about an hour and a half for the 35-mile uh, trip. Again, a pretty fast speed, uh, given the number of uh, stops. Um, they also had what they called additional trains, and these were shuttle trains that ran from Kelly to Ames. 
and they either made connections with one of these other trains coming from Fort Dodge going south, or they also made connections with the uh, northbound trains from Des Moines going to Fort Dodge. So there was quite a bit of service on there. Um, the last one uh, left at 12.50, uh, went to Boone at 1.30, left at 12, 12.55 or 12.35 at night. So from 6.30 in the morning to 12.55 at night, you had uh, train service in Ames. Okay, this is what we call a three-way meet, and this is in Kelly, and the substation in Kelly was still there um, when I moved here in 81. It was torn down sometime in the 1980s. It wasn't in use. Um, what we have here is a northbound train that came out of Des Moines and is going to uh, um, Fort Boone and then up to Fort Dodge. And then we have a southbound train from Ames that's going to go down to Des Moines after this one passes. And then this car uh, will take anybody from this train going to um, Ames. So we had a nice connection, you know, walk out off of one, walk got on the other. So that happened uh, several times a day, depending, of course, on the timetable. But this car was the shuttle car, and uh, it was used exclusively for that service. It was a kind of a combination. Uh, it had a, a low step uh, to get into it, make it a little easier to load. Uh, it didn't have the same uh, design as the higher speed cars, and it just ran back and forth as a shuttle. And I'm sure someone has made a model of that. I'd like to see that. And if you haven't made a model, your model guy should make it, because it's kind of a cute car. <laughs> Um, so some of the, uh, oh, let's do the 1917 schedule here. 1917 was the peak, peak year for the railroad in terms of ridership, mileage, uh, and profit. And of course it was World War I, there was a lot of war activity going on. Uh, Camp Dodge was very busy, uh, a lot of activity back, in, uh, back into Des Moines and then up to, uh, up to Ames. Um, so this was the peak year for uh, uh, trains. There was a two-year period where they actually uh, went into Des Moines under the Rock Island Railroad and stopped at the Rock Island Station. They had a little red wire there for, I think it was 17 and, 16 and 17 or 17 and 18 for a short period of time there. Uh, you can see a lot of trains, even an express train in the afternoon, so there was just a lot of business. They were developing the business. Uh, paved highways were not very common, and that's where they were finished off the railroads was uh, pavement. Um, this is an example. We have uh, several uh, uh, artifacts from, from the railroad. This is a typical conductor's ticket. If you bought your, bought your ticket on the train from the conductor, uh, he, and they were always he back then, would uh, uh, give you, he would punch your origin. This one was Sailor Road going to Des Moines. Uh, he put the date. This was uh, June uh, 8th, 1909. And uh, the fare was 15 cents. So he'd punch that, he'd get a copy, he'd keep a copy, and then he'd have to turn in all his copies, and then the clerk would add them all up, and he'd have to turn in the amount of money that he punched. Um, so how do you beat that? You know, transportation people are always trying to think how you can beat something, so you wouldn't collect fare, or you'd, or you'd have it. You, the auditor would know it had to be 15 cents from here to here, so the only way, you, you couldn't short the customer, because the customer had the receipt. You'd have to try and trick, trick the company. I'm sure someone was able to do it sometime. But they had a lot of waters because they had to make a profit back then, so they really had to worry about that. Uh, a couple of items here, a couple of other items from our collection. This is if you bought a ticket at the station from the station agent. This one is Kelly to Ames. You go in, you pay your fare, which probably was 20 cents or whatever it was back then. And the, the uh, agent would give you this ticket and then on the back, he would stamp the date on it. And then the conductor would punch holes in it so it couldn't be used a second time. Uh, this is another one from uh, Des Moines to Ames, another ticket, the same, same principle as, as that, uh, that ticket. Now this one says return coupon on it, so they often had a, and we don't have, I don't have the fare structure, sure someone does, but I don't have the fare structure. A lot of times there was a discount for a round trip. It wasn't two times one fare, there was a, some sort of a discount on it. Um, the item that I find really interesting is this thing called the Red Book. And I had this in my collection, and this is from New York State. And these were published, uh, uh, I don't remember the date on this, but it was in uh, 1908, from roughly 1900 to about 1920. Uh, this was a guide that uh, had hotels in it. It was aimed at traveling salesmen. 
and uh, it would have all the electric railroad schedules and then often some of the freight uh, the passenger or the steam railroad schedules also. So if you were a businessman and you got stuck in some town for whatever reason, uh, you could figure out how, what your alternative routes are. A lot of times there were two ways to get between two cities. There was a lot of railroad competition. Uh, you also uh, would have uh, information about hotels. It's kind of like, you know, you get stuck at O'Hare and you kind of go to that hotel for $200 and you can sleep on the cot, you know. Well, this was the, was the version of that. Uh, they did these, there are several of these that are regional. I've heard about these in the Midwest. Uh, they're probably an Iowa version of it. I know there's an Illinois version of it. So in your travels, if you ever run across the People's Railway Guide and it says Iowa on it, just go ahead and buy it and bring it over to the office and we will reimburse you for it because it's really, really rare. I've never seen it on eBay, haven't seen it in any of the collections, but I know it does exist. So uh, we're really interested in, in uh, acquiring one of those. So what happened to the interurban? Uh, the interurban is uh, disappeared because of paved highways is what it amounted to in buses. And I could do a, I could probably do a whole talk on buses, huh? The names, uh, the horse I ride. I could probably do something like that. That's a good idea. Uh, anyway, in 1923, I believe it was, uh, Gus Pantages, who was an Ames businessman, proposed running a bus from Ames to uh, Des Moines, and in competition with the Fort Dodge line. And uh, we have Interstate or Iowa Commerce Commission uh, uh, testimony where the president of the Fort Dodge line said that buses are dangerous, uh, they're a health hazard, uh, you know, they're unsafe, the roads aren't safe, they're the worst thing in the world, you take your life in your hands, and there should never be a bus service between Ames and Des Moines because we have this wonderful railroad. Um, the next year, okay, so Pantages didn't get the certificate to, to do that, but he started a bus from Ames to Marshalltown. Uh, and ran back and forth from Ames to Marshalltown. He got a certificate on that. Um, the next year, in 1924, uh, the president of the Fort Dodge Line went in front of the Commerce Commission, and the road had been paved to, to Des Moines, and said, buses are the greatest thing in the world. They're cost effective. They're efficient and safe. He did a complete 180 degree turn on his statement from, from the year before. And then the Fort Dodge Line secured a certificate to operate, because the certificate had value at that point. They actually had sell them between businesses, and that protected them from other bus competition. Uh, so this was the original schedule, uh, Des Moines to Ames. Now, uh, they were still running interurban cars at the time. We're not quite sure um, what the uh, schedule was, and we don't know when the interurban ended. We have, so what, what we're really looking for is 1927, 1928 schedules. We know it was out in 1929, but we don't know if it was 25, 26, it was when the the buses ran a long time with the interurban or not, so we're, we're not aware of exactly on that. So uh, if you find some Fort Dodge schedules, we'd really be interested in that. They also ran Fort Dodge to Des Moines, uh, Webster City, and they ran Fort Dodge to Algona. And uh, there was a whole interesting development of uh, bus lines at that time. Some of them buy the railroads so to crowd out the competition, and some of them in competition with the railroads. Uh, this is a Picture, well, I gotta pick the speed, huh? Okay. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of the typical bus, and uh, it's called the Wild Rose route. That was part of the branding. Uh, there was the Bluebird route, uh, gray something, gray swallow or something, but they always put a color of an animal or a bird together, or a flower or something like that. So this was the typical bus that was running between Ames and Des Moines. Uh, the power plant, where do they get the electricity? Uh, well, the electricity for the streetcar in Ames came out of the Ames power plant, 750 volts DC. Uh, the power for the uh, uh, rest of the railroad was 1200 volt DC. It was all generated in Fraser, which is, of course, long gone now. And there was a low head dam there, and you can still see the remnants when you ride the Blue and Scenic Valley when the leaves are off the trees, of uh, a low head dam that generated power. And then they had, of course, the coal plant when, the, when there wasn't enough water to uh, produce enough electricity. Um, okay, we're going to move quickly. This is the, the uh, Dinky uh, Terminal, which is now the hub on campus. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about streetcars. The streetcars, as I said, were different. This is not exhaust. They, did, they were electrically powered. All that is is dust being kicked up as the car went by. The speed limit was eight miles an hour on city streets. 
Uh, they could grow faster on their private right away. Uh, this is in Kellogg in Maine. Uh, and as you can see, it's a low step. It's easy to get people in, easy to get people out. Uh, someone was asking about what all these wires are. Those are to keep people's hands in so they don't stick their hands out and get hit by a tree or a branch or, or something like that. Um, but these are the cars that went back and forth. There were two of them in duty. There were three cars assigned to Ames. Uh, and two of them were used uh, uh, during the day. Uh, this is the first streetcar timetable. Uh, the first car was at 6.40 in the morning. The last one was at uh, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, and uh, they ran like a railroad. They had numbered trains and all that kind of stuff. That eventually went by the, by the wayside. And then this is the original interurban schedule with the connection down in, in Kelly. Uh, nice picture here of Elias, Iowa State College, Horse Barns, heading to downtown. We blew that one up today, we were looking at it, and uh, this car hit something because it's all dented in the front there. There's supposed to be a little device if the, if the uh, pole goes off the wire, it's supposed to pull the pole down so it doesn't take down the wire while well, it's gone. So something happened and the uh, maintenance may not have been uh, real good at the end there. Uh, nice shot of downtown Ames, and again, the, the, uh, the uh, end gauge in there has a, a really nice, uh, these buildings, they've really done a great job of uh, duplicating these buildings with the Northwestern Yard in the background. But as you can see, it came right down Main Street, and this was the end of the streetcar line here, right at Duff. This is uh, at Duff Avenue. Uh, here's another shot looking towards the power plant. Um, this is Douglas here. You can see the streetcar there, and you can see the interurban. Uh, looks like it's, I can't tell which way the pole is, but this went up to the hotel um, by where Van Shell Park is, and then came in and probably got in front of the interurban because he was going to go on his way to, to Des Moines there. Okay, so just like Cyrite, sometimes they get overloaded back in 1900, whatever year this was. And I see the Cyrite drivers in here, they'll testify to that. Um, uh, this car, uh, 208, um, we're not sure where it came from. It uh, doesn't have any markings on it. There was never a car number 208 in Ames. So uh, the best I can get, the best guess I have is that it came from Dubuque. They probably brought it for a football game or something, brought it over. Uh, and for you mechanical engineers in here, uh, this is called a maximum traction truck. It has a little tiny wheel here and then a big wheel here. And the theory on this, and it was very prevalent at that time, streetcars did a lot of stop and go, stop and go. So they wanted what they called maximum traction. When it was time to go, they wanted that thing to get up and go. So they thought that by having a motor on each axle that they would get more power out of the uh, smaller wheel because it would turn, make more revolutions, have, in theory, more torque. Uh, I have a picture of car 210 from Dubuque, but these wheels are reversed. The small wheel is here and the large wheel here. So I don't know the theory on that or what they were doing, but uh, anyway, they had these maximum traction trucks which proved, uh, and Iowa State College did a lot of res railroad research, uh, uh, Purdue and uh, uh, Illinois and Champaign did a lot of railroad research, and uh, at some point in the 1910s they proved that this didn't mean anything. It was a nice theory, but in reality it didn't work. Uh, didn't, didn't, there was no, no, nothing detrimental, but there was no advantage to it either. So there's some kind of event going on here. We can't figure out the location either. We're really stumped on that. Um, there's a switch here, uh, and there was a track into Exhibit Hall, which of course is all gone now. And uh, so we think this is coming off a football game from Clyde Williams Field, probably along Osborne is our guess, uh, going towards uh, uh, town. And we know that it's facing north because it's, it's winter, and. Uh, the sun is on the car, so it's a, a southern sun. Now uh, this is 288. This was one of the cars. 286 and 288 were the cars that were used in uh, uh, Ames uh, most of the time that the streetcars ran. And this is taken almost in the same location. This tree is in both pictures. And this one is also overloaded. Kind of like running two buses at the same time and all full. Same thing here. So I guess we have a 100 year tradition of doing that. <laughs> um, and uh, this was a 40-foot car, um, kind of short for the amount of uh, business that they had on these busy days. Uh, and we don't know the location, so anyone can help us on that, we'd appreciate that. Uh, this is the bridge across uh, Squaw Creek. Uh, this is the Northwestern Bridge. This is the interurban bridge, which just disappeared a couple years ago. 
the Union Pacific tried to give it to the city, and the city said, well, you can give that to us, but they give us $200,000. Mm -hmm. The Union Pacific said, well, we'll just scrap it, which they did. Uh, but there was also a pedestrian bridge here, and this flood, which I believe was 1919, took out the pedestrian bridge. And so that's why the person is walking up there. So all you children here, don't walk on the railroad tracks. <laughs> you adults, don't walk on the railroad tracks. Um, but that shows the, uh, uh, the height of the water at that time and took out the pedestrian bridge. Uh, here's 288. This is at uh, Westgate Station. You know, if you go out to Sheldon and West, there's those pillars there with the dates on them. Uh, that was the end of the, of the streetcar line uh, up until 1916. And that's uh, State Gym in the background there. And then there was a shelter. Um, so that, I'll show you a map here in a second. The 1912 route through campus, the streetcar went through downtown, I showed you that earlier, uh, came up to Osborne and then went down to Westgate, to Sheldon and West. That was changed in 1916. Uh, we don't know why, but uh, they put in a bypass. My guess is it probably just made it a little faster to go back and forth, because carry too many people, make too many stops, you get behind schedule, so this is one way to solve the problem is to uh, make the route a little more streamlined. Um, and then it also ended there, this might be that switch we were talking about on that other picture that went down to Exhibit Hall where they did the railroad research. And then of course we have the main line down to Kelly, and then this is that track where those guys, where the track workers were standing and went and delivered the coal to the power plant. And we have maps from various years on campus, and there were different little spurs here and there. Most construction materials were brought in by train. So they would put a track down and put a switch in and put some overhead wires and uh, build a building. Uh, all the materials being bought, brought in by train and then when they were done, they ripped the track up and ripped the, ripped the wire up. Uh, station A, this is Gilman Hall. You're all familiar with that today. Here's Osborne. And this was the station where people could wait uh, for the trolley to go downtown. Not the inner, but just the, uh, uh, just the streetcar. Uh, we do have some uh, uh, nice uh, documentation. Jim Pryor uh, found these when, the, uh, when they were tearing down the depot in 1965, the Fort Dodge Depot. Uh, he managed to uh, grab a lot of these things. This is a conductor's daily report from uh, 1924, I believe, 1912, at Coe, which uh, associated with Coe Flowers, I believe, uh, uh, was a, a conductor on the, on the railroad. And, uh, and it's interesting, even at this late date, it's still called Ames and College Railroad. So it may have been a separate corporate entity, or more than likely, they just had a lot of those things printed up. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, railroads tend to use everything they can. Uh, Fort Dodge, this was the submission where the, dis the conductor, Ed Coe, would put his money in there and then uh, submit it to the uh, Accountants, and they would count the money. They didn't. Everyone didn't get a ticket on a streetcar. They had a little thing they would ring, and every time you paid your fare, they were supposed to ring that. And then at the end, he took his reading, and whatever the difference was, he had to pay five cents for every time he rang, rang the bell. Uh, so the only way he could beat that is not ring the bell. Uh, but then they would have people riding to make sure you were doing that. Uh, Olsonville was a uh, florist. Uh, this this was the terminal, the uh, crew quarters, if you would, for the uh, railroad the crewmen, and there was also a floral uh, greenhouses there, and Wilson Florist was where Lucalons is now. And uh, so they grew the flowers back in the old days when I would grow things other than corn and beans, they grew flowers here, and then sold them at the, at the florist in downtown, uh, in downtown Ames. So that's the, uh, probably an entire uh, crew shot there, and all the guys working on the, on the railroad at the time. Um, here's the schedule from 1914 about every 20 minutes or so, kind of like what Cyrite does now between downtown and campus. So only uh, 99 years, 98 years later, we're running the same schedule. Uh, uh, but, uh, and then it, and they went in the evening, uh, and they, they don't have an end time, they just say, we run late. So probably they ran until people stopped writing, and that's when the, turn, that's when the line ended. So it got everybody home, kind of like uh, Cyrite's uh, Moonlight Express, I believe. Um, and then the Sunday schedule was a little different, and then they had cars to the south side, and we think that means it went down the main line, down, uh, down by Welch Avenue, down there by the towers. Probably church-related is our guess on that, to get people from that area to and from churches, because most of the churches were in downtown, uh, and then there were a couple of campus towns, mostly in downtown. 
Uh, back to this, which I'm not going to spend too much time on that. So we will talk about 1916. In 1916, the campus loop was built. And I showed you how up to 1916, the cars, the streetcars ended, ended here. Uh, I believe Clyde Williams Field was built about that time. So the railroad had this track in, so what they built is in Knapp and up Sheldon, up to uh, West Street. They built this section in 1916. And then they ran uh, the cars, they, they changed the direction every other trip. So one trip would come out like this and go around campus this way, and then the next trip would come out this way and go back that way. And uh, Farwell has several, Farwell Brown has several stories about that, uh, you know, racing the rails and things like that that uh, he used to do as a kid. Um, or no, he, was, he would say, I didn't do it as a kid, but I know others who did. <laughs> and uh, also the nice thing about this is uh, you could bring a charter up for football uh, from Des Moines, load up your interlude car in Des Moines, bring people up. Football, as we know, was very big in the teens, as it is now. And uh, your streetcar or your interlude could take you right here, right to Clyde Williams Field, where the where football was, uh, was the football field. Um, that lasted from 19, well, okay, I'll go through this picture. This is uh, construction against State Gym, and uh, this is the construction pictures of building that line down Sheldon to Nap. You can see the conditions of the road, so uh, the railroads had a pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good market there because it was pretty hard to get around, especially in the spring. Uh, this, the bleachers at Clyde Williams, and uh, the track was right there. And, Bring people right here and right into the right into the stadium. Ultimate ultimate parking experience, right? And I don't know if you had to be a donor to get a good spot or not on that. I'm not sure how they did that back then. Uh, Station B was near Curtis, and this again was the line that went from Ames on uh, a diagonal uh, through, through Campus Town. And this was the station here. The st city streetcar would stop here, and the interurbans would also stop here. So this was a primary campus stop if you were going to. Uh, to Des Moines or go to Kelly and uh, go north. Whoops, I went over there too quick. Okay, I just like this picture um, for a lot of reasons. It just shows the activity in Ames. Here's the streetcar arriving, people getting off. And again, look at all the activity there. I mean, we could spend a half hour just looking at what's going on in this picture. But, you know, Ames is where people went to shop. Uh, you know, it's just a busy, busy place. Uh, and there was a lot of pedestrian traffic because people didn't have cars, so they come in by, by the streetcar, and the, where a lot of people walked, uh, you know, they lived close by. Um, okay, now I'm going to go into uh, the, uh, uh, some of the uh, facilities. Uh, this building was the streetcar barn where the streetcars were, stole, were stored overnight. Uh, it's identified on one of the maps we have. Um, and uh, you know, this is the Ford Dodge, the loop with the, with the terminal, but this was the streetcar barn where the streetcars were stored. In 1920, I can't remember now, 22 or 23, when Davidson was being built, uh,